Thank you very much. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude for being here today and also to thank Andreas, but also the staff and the volunteers who have been working incredibly and doing just a fantastic job. So thank you. <clears throat> In the late 80s, National Geographic commissioned Gallup to do a survey of geographic literacy in the United States. And the results were, were staggering. What they found were one in seven adults in the United States couldn't find the US on an unmarked map of the world. And uh, one in four couldn't find the Pacific Ocean. Those that were here yesterday saw Miss South uh, Carolina and we saw how she expressed her knowledge of geography. So I, I looked at this and said, gee, if we are to be uh, engaged in a global discourse and we have citizens that are geographically illiterate, this doesn't work. So I thought, um, maybe I can solve that. What if, what if we could create a tool that was a common tool that people are familiar with and help them learn geography? So I had an idea and said, what if we could take a globe? What if we could make this in some way interactive to teach people? So I worked with a friend of mine from MIT, my uh, roommate, we got together and developed a technology to make a flat or three-dimensional surface touch responsive with high resolution at a low cost. And the result was this. It was called the Odyssey Atlasphere. And with this, you take a stylus and touch the surface and hear facts about the world. Religion, population, birth rates, death rates, people per telephone, music, touch any country and hear music. So this was very exciting, won some awards. But I looked at this, and one night, I had many ideas, and usually they're about 2 in the morning. So I woke up my wife at 2 in the morning and said, I have an idea. And she said, OK. And I said, I were, we're teaching my son at that point, who was 4, to read. And I said, as you look at him, look at the paper. When he looks at the book, he looks at the black lines, and all there are is squiggles. We're trying to teach him what a line is, and that squiggle is a letter with a name with a sound, and they form words. So I said, what if we could take the technology from the globe and flatten it out and put paper on it? So we could put a paper book on it, then use the same stylus, and now touch letters and hear their names or sounds, drag it across, hear words, and let the, let the kids engage in this way. So I took this idea, I talked to a few people, I said, we're going to create a paper computer that's going to help kids learn to read. And the reaction from friends was, you're crazy, loco. They said, it won't work, too expensive. Kids want video games. They want screens. They don't want paper books. Now, this was 19, at that point, 1997, so before iPads. So I persisted and, uh, and took the company I'd started, Explore Technologies, and sold it to LeapFrog. Hey, has anyone here heard of LeapFrog? OK, a few people. So what came out of this was, my invention was the leap pad. And this was a tool that you'd now take a stylus, and you could see, oh, thank you. <laughs> you could see that you could touch letters on the, on the paper and hear their sounds. You could go, w -I -G -Ls, wiggles, or t -up -a top, and touch words and characters, and the characters would speak. So we made progress with this, and the idea that people said was crazy wasn't so crazy, because in four years, we had leap pads in the hands of over 40 million kids. And within five years, we had a teaching tool to help reading in about 100 million, uh, we exposed 100 million people. And out of this, the leap pad sold for at the time about $49, dropped to 39. I had another idea and said, what if we make this half size? And we spoke to the, uh, the uh, Secretary of State uh, human, uh, Health and Human Services and, uh, and did a half-size version that cost less than $10 and shipped 50000 to Afghanistan to help women and, and, and families and children learn about depression, nutrition, sanitation, health care. So that grew out. But I wasn't satisfied because the modes of learning the Leap Pad offered were listening and reading. And I wanted to add the remaining modes, which are speaking and writing. So what we did is we created more versions of this. One had a microphone you'd flip up, and now you could speak, and it would record your voice. Another had a pencil, you can see, and uh, now you could write on it. So now we had this, this tool that supported reading, writing, speaking, listening, four basic modes of human communication. But I want to go further, and I read about a, a company in Sweden that had a technology that lets you print dots on a piece of paper with a printer. And doing so, you could put a camera in a pen, then drag the pen across the paper, regular pen, write on it, and digitize your ink as you drew on it. And I thought, that's it. If I could take that technology, and we could turn that pen into a computer that was fully multimodal, meaning reading, writing, speaking, listening, then we'd have something. So I went and brought the technology back, and this is what we created. This was called the Fly Pen Top computer, like laptop, 
desktop, laptop, pen top, but this one still was short. It had a micro, it had a speaker, and you could write, but it didn't have enough. So I wanted to go further. So I wanted to move up in age as well. So I left Leapfrog and started another company called Livescribe. And the idea now was to create something that would work all together. So this is the Livescribe smart pen. So what I'd like to do is, uh, is show you, uh, first of all, 750. I'll show you a short video. It's about two minutes to give you a sense. Then we'll demonstrate it, and you can see it in practice. OK, so we'll go here. This is, by the way, what it looked like inside. And there was a lot of technology in this. So if we look at this, there we go. Hopefully we have sound. Great. Note taking hasn't changed very much in the past 2,000 years. You have an idea, an important task. You try to jot it down so you can remember the conversation and act upon it. Then, if you are a heavy note taker, you repeat this process on lots and lots of pages. The result? There are millions of pages of notes written every day. But how many of them are actually used later? How many great ideas or important conversations have been lost? In the past three years, a very big change has quietly happened. Notes have gone digital. Today, there are over 5 million pages of digital notes, called pencasts. They are on PCs, Macs, websites, and blogs, even iPads and iPhones. Pencasts are interactive notes synced with audio. They are searchable, shareable, and they are made using a pen, a smart pen, by Livescribe. The idea behind Livescribe is to truly set your note-taking free and connect everything you hear, say, and write to your digital world. Livescribe allows you to store your notes safely in your personal cloud, which means you get to play back all of your important notes wherever you want, whenever you want, on any device you want. Let's say you have a big biology test tomorrow. You crack open your computer in the morning and start reviewing pincasts of your class lectures, saving time by searching for keywords in your notes like mitochondria. Later, in your study group, your friends ask for your digital notes from class, which you promptly send to them digitally from your paper. While on the way to the test, you play back some of the more confusing points from the lecture from your iPhone, just to make sure you're ready. Now, imagine if it was that easy to actually use your notes for all your classes, all your meetings, all your ideas, anywhere. With Livescribe smart pins, notes aren't just useful, they are connected. You can send action items from a meeting directly to your team through Google Docs, or you can email a sketch of your design concept to a client, or even send your friend a love note on Facebook. With everything you hear and write accessible from wherever you are, finding what you need when you need it, and sharing it, is easy. That's all your notes in one place. That's truly note-taking unbound. Livescribe. Set your note-taking free. Thank you. Thank you. So now let's switch to uh, taking a look at it in action. So this, this is a smart oh. pen. And if I hold it up, uh, we switch to the camera. If we can take a, hopefully, there we go. Great. So uh, what I'll do now is this is a note. I have a paper notebook. And it has pieces of plain paper. The paper has been printed with some very small dots. And there's controls at the bottom. You can take a piece of copy paper, put it in a laser printer, and print your own paper for free. So it's just plain paper with some ink on it. But look what happens. When I now take my pen and I write at the top of the page, I'll write uh, Ciudad de las Ideas. That is now stored in the pen. When I dock it, it goes to my computer, and I have a copy of it. But if we look at the bottom of the page, there's some controls here. One is record. If I touch this, my pen now says it's recording. And um, if I write now, I'll write one. This is the Echo Smart Pen. It has built-in speaker, a mic, a display, audio I.O., and a USB. If I write two, two, I'll draw a picture of a PC or a Mac. As I'm writing right now on paper, it's digitizing my notes. And it will move them eventually to the PC. But if I come back and touch the paper, which I'll do in a moment, you'll hear the audio play back at the instant I wrote this on the paper. Three. Three. The third part is now there's a cloud. So now we can connect this and ship the information through the cloud to Evernote, Google Docs, Facebook, Dropbox. We can even do an email, or we can make PDFs. So let's try it. So that was 43 seconds that I've recorded. If I touch Stop right now, and now I'll plug in uh, audio which is uh, here. 
we go. Okay, if we switch to pen audio and I touch this. All right, one. This there is we go. Echo Smart Pen. If I touch two. Speaker. Two. Two, I'll draw a picture of a PC or a map. Or As three. I'm writing right, three. The third part is now there's a cloud. Okay. So, now we so I have access to the ink and the audio that I've written. Thank you. So I'm going to unplug this. So now what I'll do is I'm going to plug it in and uh, dock it. So now it goes off to my, uh, my computer. But in the meantime, I'm going to show you one other, one other demo. So while that's transferring, I wanted to make the pen be a computer, which means that um, it, this is a screen now, and the pen is my computer. So I said, gee, how do I launch applications? So I had the idea of saying, OK, what if I draw a line like this over and back, and I'll now write the word translate, T-R-A-N-S. And there it is. And my pen says, Spanish. Spanish. If I touch it again, write a word. tells me to write something. So if I write a word like one, O-N-E, uno, and it shows uno in the pen. If I write, uh, it's late on Saturday, so let's write beer. Cerveza. And how about, please? Por favor. Now let's go touch them. Uno, cerveza, por favor. Thank you. So if, I, uh, if I'd like to, I can switch Mandarin. to another language, like Chinese. E and you can see the language. If you could look at the display, the full iconographic characters are there. This is a demonstration, but there's full dictionaries coming. Ching. And if I switch again. Mandarin, Arabic. Wahed, bira, min fadluk. OK, so, and which is an interesting min word. Min so uh, let me try something else, though, that's fun. If I draw another line, this is just for fun, to show off the potential of a pen that is a computer. It says piano. Draw your piano. First, draw nine vertical lines from left to right. So we'll draw some lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Connect the lines on the top and bottom. Do top, do bottom. Write the letter I. Put an I. This is your instrument icon. Write the letter R. R. This is your rhythm track. Tap the keys to play. So on the piece of paper with a pen, we've built a piano. OK. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. I'd like to show you what happens. I'm switching back here to my screen. That, when it moves to the PC, becomes something that's called a pen cast. So if you can, great, you can see this. So this, for instance, is a pen cast that a reporter did interviewing a uh, rocket scientist about how a rocket works. And all they did is write it on their notebook. Then they were able to, if we click here, we'll get full screen. Now you can play this by clicking on it. So if I click his name. I'm the vice president of propulsion here at SpaceX. And if I'd like to, I can scroll this. Merlin so I could now see how the ink was written. Engine. I can go back and forth. And wherever chamber I click, cool the chamber, sort of like the is two back-to-back -back impellers on a single shaft that pump the liquid okay. oxygen, which I'll show a line connecting to the pump here. So, so we have uh, we have some pretty powerful pen casts. Now, these pen casts can be used for teaching. Students will think aloud and share their notes as they're solving a math problem. Reporters, journalists, we solve problems for students with special needs, ADHD. And, uh, and further, this pen that I've described connects to a, uh, a cable, to USB. We've just announced a week ago a version of a pen that now is wireless, which means you can now just very simply, everything I showed that might look complex, take it out, write on a notebook, it goes to Evernote, and you have all your notes and all your audio instantly accessible. So that's happened as well. I'm going to go one more. At the risk of, um, of doing something, I wanted to share, I was motivated by the story that went on earlier today, and wanted to share something personal. Um, I had a son who was born premature. He weighed about 3 pounds, 12 ounces. We heard yesterday what that could mean. Well, some, some amazing things happened along the way. So here's a very short uh, explanation. Um, when he was young, there's a picture of him. And uh, he was quite precious to us. I introduced the globe to him when he was four, and he sat down and played with it, and I watched his reaction. And this is a prototype, and he was very excited. But um, by the time he got to eight years old, I asked him in the car one day when we were riding together, said, what are you thinking? And he said, I don't know. At which point I said, you should know, because what I'd like you to do is pick something you love, a passion that you have, something that's really important to you, and think about an idea you might have about it, a problem to solve. Now I want you to do three of those and have them in your mind all the time. 
So you always have something to think about because then when you meet people, when you have a new experience, they're in your mind and you'll solve them. So here's what happened. He did, he began to do what we talked. When he got to fourth grade, he met a friend and he decided he liked chemistry. So we started buying chemicals on the internet. And, uh, and I told him, well, one other thing, aside from the ideas in your mind, I said, I want you to remember, and this was in my family, my two children, there are two words that are not part of our lives. One is can't, the other is impossible. They are banned from our, our, our family. So he went forward in that way. Well, he went to Boy Scouts. He looked like he was responsible. I thought, good. Um, he took some karate, which was great. He even learned how to negotiate. I had an electric car, and he had a first date and said, Dad, can I use the keys? But then came the uranium. So I came home one day, and there on the kitchen table was a hunk of uranium. And I looked around the kitchen. I heard click, 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 click. He had Geiger counters all around the kitchen. He said, don't worry, Dad. It's okay. And I went over and said, can I pick it up? He said, don't, no, don't pick it up. So it wasn't okay. But um, he proceeded to this. He had an idea for an experiment. So he shipped it off to the high school, and he wanted to do something to address cancer. And now he was 18 years old. This happened last year. Um, from there, what happened is he did some remarkable science. He took some tin particles, chopped them up, said if we could put this in a tumor and expose it to radiation, we could create what's called secondary radiation, and in that way, it would kill the local uh, toxic, or the cancer in a local area. And this was his idea. So he built it. He measured it, and uh, he was picked to go to the Intel Science Fair, which is a science fair which has, they start with 7 million people, they bring 1,500, and he was there. Well, what happened, I went down, and the day before the awards, I took some pictures, but um, then he was there for the judging. And he'd lost at a, at a state level. He came in second place, so they didn't think they had much of a shot. But the moment came, and the judges said, well, this year, something different happened. We have, for the first time, a team of two people. And uh, they continued to speak and said, in fact, the two boys are from California. And here's a picture of Matt and Blake, as he kept saying, and they're from California, and they've created something that has an effect on cancer. And we would like to announce that Blake Margraf and Matt Federson have won the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, which was... Bravo. I'm way past time, but the final note is remember two things if I could offer them. We're wrapping up uh, the, uh, uh, the conference and take away two thoughts. If you have kids or might have kids or around people in the future, always remember, keep several problems in mind that are passions that you have. And always remember, can't and impossible should be banned from your thinking. And if you do that, you'll change the world. Thank you very much. Bravo.